Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Rachel Nelson, Director of UC Santa Cruz Institute of the Arts and Sciences. And with my collaborator, here we go, Professor Gina Dent, I'm happy to welcome you to the next event in visualizing the Visualizing Abolition series. Tonight, we're, today, we're thrilled to have cultural and visual studies theorists, Nicole Fleetwood, Herman Gray, and Nick Mirzoff join us. For those of you who are new to visualizing abolition, these talks are part of a larger initiative at UC Santa Cruz on art and abolition. The events complement Barring Freedom, an art exhibition made in collaboration with our partner institution, San Jose Museum of Art. The exhibition has been open since October 30th, but with the current conditions of the pandemic in California, as of today, the museum is temporarily closed. This is just the latest challenge. The exhibition was planned before the pandemic and it was supposed to also be shown at our other partnering institutions, UC Santa Cruz, Mary Porter Sesnon Art Gallery and in New York at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. The growing urgency of the conversations and activism around art, inequality, policing, prisons, systemic racism and abolition has meant that despite the obstacles to having the exhibition in physical spaces, here we are. And in our shift online, we have not only produced this event series, but working with Barring Freedom co-curator Alexandra Moore and our excellent graduate student fellows, Abram Stern and Aaron Malenga. We've also created a website of exhibition resources, artist interviews, and music videos curated by Terry Lynn Carrington, which you can find at barringfreedom.org. The events in Visualizing Abolition, including past conversations with Gina, Angela Davis, and Brian Stevenson are recorded and can also be found on the website. So while we might have to wait to get back into museums and into classrooms, do check it out at barringfreedom.org. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> Thanks, Rachel. And welcome everyone. I'm Gina Dent, and I've been so looking forward to this conversation. The work of Nicole Fleetwood, Herman Gray, and Nicholas Mirzoff has been central to how Rachel and I have conceived of the Visualizing the Abolition series. In our first two events, in conversations with Angela Davis and Brian Stevenson, we introduced some ideas about the role of art, visual culture, and the imagination, both in sustaining prisons and in their undoing. To expand on these ideas, I am so glad to welcome Herman Gray, Nic Nicole Fleetwood, and Nicholas Mirzoff to join me on screen. Welcome, it's so wonderful to see you. Herman, Nicole, Nick, thanks so much for being with us today. I know we all wanna to get to the conversation, but I do wanna introduce you three briefly to our audience. And I'll start with Herman Gray. Herman, I'm grateful you are here both as a moderator and as a contributor to this important conversation. Now Professor Emerita in sociology at UCSC, your extensive research writing and teaching on media and television studies and black cultural politics and on music is foundational not only in the study of media and visual popular culture, but also our, to our conception of this program. Thanks for letting us lure you back to UCSC, even <laughs> if only virtually. And Nicole Fleetwood, the exhibition you've created that is currently on view at MoMA PS1, Marking Time, Art in the Age of Mass Incarceration, as well as the book by the same title is simply amazing. For anyone who does not know about this remarkable work of scholarship and curation on what Nicole calls carceral aesthetics, please check it out, Marking Time. This is a part of a beautiful trajectory you've had as a writer, curator, and professor of American studies and art history at Rutgers University. Your sustained focus on art, black visual culture and visuality through your books on racial icons, blackness and the public imagination, and troubling vision, performance, visuality, and blackness has really built toward these deep explorations into visual and carceral economies in the US. And we are so glad you've joined us today. Last but not least, Nicholas Mirzoff. In the fields of visual cultural studies like Herman and Nicole, you need little introduction. Your books on visual culture and visuality, including The Right to Look, A Counter History of Visuality, How to See the World, and the appearance of Black Lives Matter have been formative. You also combine scholarship and activism, first with the Occupy movement and now, and now um, with all the monuments must fall. 
the movement to take down statues commemorating settler colonialism and or white supremacy. I hope, I know that the three of you it, are gonna make an amazing conversation and we hope everyone also who is watching will participate. Time's been set aside for questions, so please do put them in the Q&A at any point. We'll get to as many as possible. All right, without further ado, I turn it over to Herman. Thank you. Thank you, Gina, and uh, thank you, Rachel. Uh, it's, it's really quite an honor to be here and uh, to join the conversation with uh, Nick and Nicole. It's, it's, it's an occasion that I think is marked by some really remarkable um, provocations, remarkable works that we'll get into and talk about. Um, I wanted to uh, say a little bit about how we're gonna proceed. Um, what we'll do is um, we'll, we'll uh, each take a turn and, and talk a bit uh, about our work and about how we think about this issue of visuality and visual culture. Um, and then um, we will talk among ourselves about some of the provocations that come up. Um, and then we'll open it up to um, questions and, and, and answers. Um, I'm particularly honored um, and, 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 and really happy to be a part of this because I recall talking to Rachel, I don't know, it must have been what, two years ago, maybe three years ago about um, what a project like this might look like. And um, of course, to see it come to fruition in the context of uh, UCSC, in the context of Black Lives Matter, in the context of uh, an election that we just had sort of makes the issues and the urgency all that more important. I wanna uh, begin by um, maybe building on something that uh, Brian Stevens said in his conversation with Gina Dent last week. Um, which was that the transition to freedom pursued through abolition requires an imagination and the means to reach for it. For this reason, repair, restoration, and reparation are part of the transition to a sustained mode of freedom. And this transition involves moving away from making the victim of state violence responsible for their own restoration and not the broader society and relationship. Um, I think that's a really powerful uh, observation. And the reason I wanted to start with it, because I think uh, we're collectively, all three of us, interested in the elements, the examples, the registers, the histories of contestations, and the productive spaces and practices where people visualize and deploy abolitionist aesthetics of freedom. And that project, of course, involves visuality, aesthetics, visual culture. Um, and I think we wanted to try to delve into those kinds of histories and those kinds of examples in both the work that Nicole has curated with the bookmarking time and in the comment that Nick has written about uh, the appearance of Black Lives Matter. We'll, we'll sort of delve into that a little bit more deeply in a moment. Um, I think this issue of formalizing or thinking about visual abolition is also connected to something um, that Nicole sort of highlights in her work, certainly around the, the aims, the incommensurability of the aims of the carceral state uh, whom it holds captive and how incarcerated people understand themselves, imagine themselves, um, engage with the relationships both inside and outside of their imprisonment. Um, and similarly, I think the reason that this is a productive place to begin is because Nick similarly raises questions about the distinction between image representation and appearance and the field of visuality as a field of power. How ought we think about looking relations, visuality, seeing uh, within the context of power and hence how might we think about the histories of things like surveillance and the histories about uh, looking back and the histories of the right to look as he calls it. Um, so this is kind of the framework within which we're gonna explore um, in our conversation today. And, and I'm gonna just kind of end briefly with uh, some remarks about my own work in media studies and um, kind of how I kind of take up some of these questions. Um, a lot of my work has been focused on 20th century network television 
but also 20th century cultural politics of race and blackness in particular. And I wanna think about television as a contested space, as a theater of struggle, as a space in which the, the common sense is struggled over about what blackness means, how it's signified, to whom it refers. And within that context, um, the thematic of this, of this presentation is really around normalization. How do we normalize the power relationships through which visuality works in conjunction with the state, in conjunction with common sense, in conjunction with media institutions to naturalize um, market relations, to naturalize inequalities, to make citizenship seem like it's a kind of entitlement uh, based on the, the sort of stigmas that are applied or not applied to certain segments of the population, including incarceration. So the question of security, the question of protection, the question of who deserves it, all of these are questions that I want to suggest are really worked through within media studies and within television and within media sites as um, sites of what I'm calling contestation. And in this sense, I think one can think about blackness itself as a kind of contested field, both within um, African-American communities and communities of color, but also across and in relationship to other forms of visual um, power. Um, now, this also brings us to uh, a way of actually thinking about something like television and its normalization of policing, its normalization of, of the carceral state. And, you know, one can see some of this at work in something like the television uh, reality programs like COPS or television procedurals or ride-alongs that news organizations often do with policemen. Um, and what one thinks about are the ways in which these shows produce heroic figures in the, in the guise of policing and police people as both natural as right and therefore as heroic figures, part of their work is certainly to um, ensure some version, some, some model about safety and security and protection. So all of these are ways in which I think television content produces and is engaged in the work of normalizing, in the work of actually naturalizing policing through the figure of the heroic police person, or through the figure of the stigmatized black body that's already criminalized in much of the ways in which we have seen this on television. Now, one of the things that's really interesting about this sort of, sort of way of talking about it that I wanna just push on a little bit um, are the ways in which I think the thematics of both Nicholas, Nick and uh, Nicole have suggested that this is a theater of struggle. This is a feel of struggle. And therefore it's not without an attempt to contest, push back, construct alternate versions of what Nicole calls the conception of the self that exceeds the boundaries of the carceral state. In other words, uh, what she calls making trouble or what Nick calls the right to look, right? So, so the question of how the right to look and making trouble for vision happens in the context of television and happens in the context of streaming services is really a, quite remarkable to try to think about uh, kind, of, kind of how we make sense of that. And part of what I'm suggesting is that we're in a moment of what I call the proliferation of blackness, the proliferation of black image. And therefore it muddies the water to try to decide about these questions of contestation and policing and naturalization of security, that this is kind of a moment in which um, I think we need a real critical discernment of the kind that um, both Nick and Nicole are offering in their work for us to think with and to think about. How does normative um, blackness become or how does blackness become the site of hyper visibility around criminality and at the same time, the entree, the, the point of uh, entry point into a kind of normative model of citizenship and a normative model of whiteness, right? So that, that those questions, it seems to me, strike uh, really us very, very poignantly now, given the 
different kinds of platforms, the different kinds of political economies that create content in, in, in this moment. The final thing that I would just say is that uh, in this context, we wanna think a little bit about questions of care. I'm really interested in questions of vulnerability, questions of care, and whether or not we are capable in our route to the transition that Brian Stevens talks about, engage in a politics of care in the context of the media as the site for contesting some of what both Nicole and Nick uh, have to, have to uh, teach us about carcerality and about the right to look. So I'm gonna stop because um, we could go on with this, but I think Nicole and, 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 uh, and Nick have much to add. So let's turn it over to Nick and, um, and, and listen for a bit. Thank you very much, Herman. And I am so honored and humbled to be on this panel with you both and to be part of this astonishing project. And I just want to thank everybody uh, on screen and off who has been involved in this and everyone who has shown up, uh, if there are people out there, um, to watch us this evening. It's, um, it's a remarkable project to talk about visualizing abolition because one of the things that struck me when I thought about what to say in this context is that that's exact, it's a contradiction. Abolition is what is not supposed to happen if visualizing works because visualizing is a colonial technology of domination and it works by means of erasure and enclosure and the creation of hierarchy. And abolition obviously is the refusal of all of that. So visualizing abolition is in the language of social movements an impossible demand. And impossible demands are the ones that we need to make, I think, and the, the, the most important ones, no? So what I wanted to, when I started to think about this, that meant that I want a new way to think about what it is that we're engaging with in Nicole's exhibition, in the exhibition Barring Freedom. Seems to me that it is what Christina Sharp has called the practice of the ethics of seeing. And in that sense then, seeing is a multi-sensory embodied activity that centers precisely around what Herman was calling care a moment ago. And I want to suggest that that results not so much in images which are flat theological things, but in relation, in relation between people. And this relation creates social space, uh, what I call elsewhere the space of appearance, a kind of space without the state, which is not to say without collective provision. And the space is itself the result of encounter between visualizing as colonizing force and what Cedric Robinson calls its anti-logics, which is to say the resistance to racial capitalism. That space then is created by repeating folds, which beautifully described by Catherine McKittrick, in plantation time space. And it crosses time in that different temporalities coexist in that space and enable each other. We see this many times in Nicole's exhibition. It's haunted, if you like, so long as haunting is a good thing. And from the accumulation of those folds, it is layered and it has depth, it's three-dimensional allowing also for the resonance of what has been lost and what remains. So like the incarcerating state that it refuses, it passes between media in the sense of land and sea and air. And from the connections between depth and time come unexpunged energy from past moments of resistance and refusal when the time is right. And I, my sense is that this is that time. For non-Indigenous people identified as white, like myself, there has to be a recognition too that access to this space is conditional, not absolute. At the Asiti Sikoan encampment at Standing Rock, they put it to us like this. This is a ceremony. Act accordingly. Now, they say there are no rules, but you need to figure out, we need to figure out for ourselves how that action should be taken. What I want to do just very quickly is to just show you a few ideas about how that space might look and what we might do with it. Mm 
Let's go into screen share. There we go. So I want to suggest then that the number of modes of spatializing that we can think about. And I want to start by this concept that I'm using at the moment of white seeing, that there is a way to see the world which is con constituted by whiteness and its mode of erasure. And I often think in that context of this image, which is a familiar one to visual culture students, but I also think of it as one of the most violent images there is. Hmm. It's an image of a soldier placing a space under surveillance. And I want us to think of that white space in the square there as real space in a number of senses, space that's been erased by settlement and by colonization, space that is therefore claimed and owned by white coloniality. And you see the little numbers around the edge. It means it's quantifiable. That is to say real, particularly real estate. And so this kind of top-down vision inaugurates a long mode of white seeing. This is the theory. This, as I've often written, is the practice on the plantation. The figure in the middle here is the overseer whose work it is to put that white seeing into practice in order to convert violence into value, which is what coloniality and racial capital do. Uh, they're producing indigo here. This modality has a long life to it, and I'll just signal this with this image, which is a drone uh, used by the Israeli Defense Force. It's actually an advert for it. And the, you'll see that the configuration of the way that the drone sees is analogous exactly to that used in the 17th century. The white space here now has a name. It's called a kill box. And what that means is, as you might expect, that anything or anyone that can be seen within the kill box may be killed. There is now a United States military manual on the kill box. You have to fill in a form. There's an entire bureaucracy then of white seeing that persists to the present. That white seeing was first disrupted by the Haitian Revolution because the Haitian Revolution, amongst its many things, accomplishments, claims constituent power, which is to say the power to write a constitution, which it did, uh, showing you here uh, on the right hand side, in two key clauses. One that brings these modalities of time together that I mentioned earlier on, slavery is abolished forever, past, present, and future in a single sentence. And then it's second and most audacious claim, I think, that everyone on the island is to be known only by the generic application of blacks. In French, noir, not the neg that was used to describe the enslaved. That is to say then that ancestry is not the determination of affiliation. It's your association with the revolution. It's the creation of a specific space within the island. So that is a space in which it is possible in some sense uh, to be black in a very different way. The reaction to that was immediate and immense across the Americas and the colonial world in Europe. They begin by describing a racialized hierarchy of different types of human and non-human life. This is a familiar image, unfortunately. On the bottom level of existence are the apes and simians, here the orangutan. In the middle, a separate type, the African. On the top, not a human form at all, a statue. The statue of the Apollo Belvedere, which is known to this writer because Napoleon had looted it from the Vatican and placed it in the Louvre. And so uh, Gina mentioned at the beginning this idea that we're trying to take down monuments. This is why statues are not an example of whiteness, though it's very full. They're the modality through which whiteness creates and visualizes itself. The second reaction is this term visuality, which is an attempt then to claim all visualizing for the power of the hero uh, made by Thomas Carlyle. I'd like to show him in this painting, which was slashed by the suffragette Anne Hunt in 1914. Very deliberate act on her part. And here now we connect directly to the history of carcerality because Carlyle was opposed to 
the liberal mode of the prison as he saw it espoused by Jeremy Bentham, the Panopticon. He preferred this kind of system. This is a prison within the castle colony of Australia on the island Norfolk Island, which was described by Carlyle as a stone-walled silent system. That is to say for Carlyle, there's no possibility of reform or redemption of what he called the devil's legion of the criminals, but there must only be removed, disposed of, set aside. And I think it's all too clear, unfortunately, how that legacy continues to, in, in, to pertain today. Both of these, if we add them together, the, the attempt to create hierarchy and to create disposable people engendered what I call the black radical visual tradition. This is on the right here, obviously, Sojourner Truth, uh, who sold this photograph to support her abolitionist activities. And on the left, Frederick Douglass, who in 1861 names this tradition as picture making. And give, you know, what he argues in that lecture is that what distinguishes all humans is their capacity to make pictures. And that, that is across all forms of ancestry and descent, not characterized by separate type. I won't say too much about this because later in this series, Isaac Julian will be here to talk about his wonderful film, Lessons of the Hour. But I did want to signal that that tradition clearly and importantly exists. I also just wanted to note, uh, may still be able to hear in my accent, the traces of the fact that I grew up in Britain. And I'm thinking of the notion of the way of seeing that emerged in the supposedly decolonial moment in Britain in 1960, creating what I want to call the always already hostile environment. That is to say Britain is at the moment notorious for its hostility to migrants and refugees. It has always been like that. And it was entirely self-evident to George Lamming who visited Britain in the period uh, at an extraordinary event where he is speaking at the Institute of Contemporary Art. Uh, he's reading a poem and then another poet, an East End Jewish radical called Emmanuel Litvinov, uh, excuse me, uh, gets up and uh, speaks and denounces T.S. Eliot, who was also in the room, as an anti-Semite. And the whole room erupts. And Lamming says, is that moment, I begin to understand the way of seeing, because he sees how the other is seen, and he sees that it pertains to him. And he says the ICA, became the neighbor of Notting Hill. And Notting Hill is that part of London uh, in which racialized violence had broken out in 1958 and 59. And a photograph by, here by Roger Main. I, could I can talk about this at great length, but I don't have anything like the time. I'd just like to note, finally, that this is where Stuart Hall began his career as an activist working in Notting Hill, creating a youth club and a housing association there and working alongside of Roger Main and Colin McInnes, the novelist who wrote the, the Absolute Beginners. So in other words, a visual culture that affiliates to the politics of decolonial ways of seeing traces itself to George Lamming and the politics of Notting Hill more than it does to John Berger in 1973. Finally, let us just speak very briefly about our present disastrous moment. Uh, which seems to me to be a, a very striking event in the recent election, uh, which I'm calling white to blue. And this is the flag in the background is known as back to blue. You may have seen this on Trump rallies and elsewhere. It imagines the thin blue line, which is the police here below in the description of the man who made this are so-called criminals. In other words, what we are seeing here is a depiction of Du Bois's color line but now replace the police take over that role. But what I think has happened in the election campaign we've just had is the whiteness has entirely shifted to blue so that, and we saw this all over the country, these kinds of rallies, uh, these were ones in New York, in which the thin white line, excuse me, the thin blue line that was the police uh, has now, as it were, filled in the entirety of this area that I've been describing. And it forms, as it were, a neo-confederacy in which blueness, so the white, has now been displaced by the blue. And this, of course, resonates powerfully with the way that 
Nicole Fleetwood's beautiful exhibition has described color and carceral blue. And this is an appropriate moment then for me to sign off and to turn over to her and to, for us to learn about her wonderful show. Thank you. Thank you so much, Herman and Nick. I'm so happy to be in conversation with both of you. And thank you, Rachel, Gina, Chloe, everyone named and unnamed who made this possible. It really is a tremendous gift to us all that you curated the space for us to have these conversations and to practice community and, <laughs> and belonging in ways that we want to be together. And so I just, I really honor this space and, and, um, and, and I feel honored to be a part of it. Um, so I am going to talk um, um, briefly through a set of images. And um, these are images from, from, from my book and um, from the ex ex exhibition, Marking Time at PS1. And so I just, you know, it's just kind of informal and very much in conversation with what Herman and Nick um, have already said. And I, and I wanna just say, and I mean this, um, and, and I, I mean this fully and, and completely that I've been thinking alongside Herman and Nick for many years. Um, I first encountered Herman when I was in grad school at Stanford and he is as generous as he is brilliant. He's as kind as he is a power intellectual powerhouse and he's always been an enormous supporter. So thank you so much, Herman. And Nick and I, I, I wrote Nick when I read one of his books and told him how much I loved it. And he responded immediately and, and with the same kind of kindness and, and care and generosity. So thank you for um, modeling um, you know, a way of being in this world that um, we can all learn from. So um, the project I've been working on at, for a number of years is called Marking Time. And, um, and it really just, it really started with um, just very personal experiences of um, visiting incarcerated relatives in prisons in Ohio um, and, and actually doing a lot of these visits while in graduate school. Um, my cousin Alan was sentenced to life in prison when I was um, in 1994 and I had just graduated from undergrad and, and was literally moving out to California and started at Stanford not too long after that. And, and just really experiencing this disconnect that I think a lot of um, black folks and Latinx folks in that academy experience between uh, their like lived experience and their, the communities that they are that they grow up in and and what 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 happens um, on university campuses across across the country. So I was just I was really felt this huge disconnection between um, what was happening in the classroom and what was happening in my um, with my family. And so eventually I started writing about these and just um, these images of visiting my cousin Alan and my cousin DeAndre and other incarcerated relatives and not knowing where this was gonna lead me, but knowing that I wanted another way to be in, in the academy. And I wanted another way of being in conversation with my cousin Alan, even though he was um, potentially spending the rest of his life in prison. Um, and, and through the, the act of like sharing these um, images, these vernacular photographs, um, when I was invited to give talks at like um, art centers or universities, um, a, a community, just an incredible group of people um, started sharing with me. Um, I, over the course of many years, I um, interviewed about 70 currently and formerly incarcerated artists, abolitionists, teachers, some prison staff. And um, just started amassing this incredible collection of work coming um, out of US prisons. And, and what I have to say is that part of it was also like um, through a kind of really like um, a proximity to these images of my cousin and really paying attention to my aunt Sharon, who's in the white dress here and the kind of way, the practices of care that she, you know, you ask about care, Herman. And, and as I was thinking of like, what is the method that I go about this project? It was really just paying attention to what my, uh, the women in my family have been doing all of my life. The, the, the this incredible ways of um, quotidian, but incredible ways of um, keeping family together, keeping communities together, um, a kind of fearless to-do-ness about what it is that needs the, the necessity of, of, of certain things that we have to do late, very, you know, the labor of care. 
Um, and, um, and so I really tried to, as much as possible, um, use my, like my, have my aunt and my cousin serve as the models for how I wanted to go about the work I was doing. Um, and I have to say, as I was learning about just the kind of the visual culture of incarceration, not from the side of penal spectatorship, which Michelle Brown uses that to talk about the way we look at through carceral logics, but the way of um, a type of underside or a type of what Nick says is counter visuality, what incarcerated people are doing inside prisons um, in the service of art making, in the service of self making, in the service of uh, creating really radical practices of belonging. And so once I kind of detach from the pain, and not detached as in, in a <laughs> European white way of detaching, but once I realized that this was beyond me, I, I could see this image for a lot more than um, separate my separation from Alan and his separation from our family, but that the um, person who was taking this picture was someone in prison and that the backdrop was painted by imprisoned people, right? So I started seeing like this incredible, uh, these incredible practices that were taking place in punitive captivity and just got more and more interested in um, what it means and what it takes and the risks involved in, in um, aesthetic discernment and artistic practice and creating radical collectives inside prison. And so I, I opened the book with this um, self portrait, this painting by Ronnie Goodman and I, and the exhibition closes with this image and Ronnie Goodman, um, this is uh, in this art um, corrections art studio at San Quentin. Um, and I, I really love this because I think it's such a portal into um, the questions that really interested me about um, the kind of the, you know, the possibility, and I don't want mean this in a romantic way at all, but what do we practice? Is, is it possible to practice freedom while held in punitive captivity? Um, what it means to, um, to kind of dream and to plan and to use the resources of the prison um, in the service of art making. And um, Ronnie Goodman, uh, I just want to say this about Ronnie Goodman because it's important for me to acknowledge his life and his artwork, um, was really in, in, incredible interlocutor for this project. And he, after he was released from prison, was unhoused in San Francisco for many years and was part of the Occupy movement and did an incredible work around Occu the Occupy movement. And he died um, in the Mission District on, this, on, on the street, on the corner of um, um, 16th and Cap um, in August of this year. Um, and it was only through being able to talk to him about this project and the work that he was doing here that I was able to move beyond just like kind of an art historical approach and, and think about um, what else was happening in here. And he was talking about how like, not only was he painting himself, but he only, he only did this work when he also knew that he was gonna be released. So it was a way of memorializing this kind of space. But he also said he was curating around him so that he was bringing close and you know, and this is Brian Stevenson talks about proximity, but it's also a kind of proximity he's creating and in, inside this space of bringing the people close to him who had, uh, who had been in that space with him, who he had um, worked with very closely um, in terms of art making in prison. Um, but I use this as a way of talking about some of the um, issues that come up for me in the exhibition in the book. And I'm going to move faster because I, I, I know I can just like talk, talk, talk. Um, one is like the idea of penal space. So I think about the conditions that art making takes place inside U.S. prisons, but also art making by a lot of people who are not in prison, art, art, art by people who are in the Barring Freedom show, like Maria Gaspar, an American artist, and a, a range of incredible artists who are like deeply and rigorously interrogating the carceral state. Um, and they're in conversation with the work of people who are held in punitive captivity. And so some of the um, issues that come up for me was like the thinking about, Nick brought up time and space. And like for me, so the, these issues that just kind of really uh, kept circulating in my mind as I was like working on this project and also curating the exhibition is like the use of penal space and the space as the built environment of the prisons, but it's something else. It's beyond that. It's also like the kind of psychic social relations that are structured through carcerality 
and this really incredible graphite collage by Tamika Cole, who was um, in prison in Alabama for 26 years. To me, is like really reflective of like thinking about that kind of psychic space. Um, it's a work that she made as a way of actually resisting and kind of refusing a, a type of abuse that she was receiving from the prison staff. And then I also, I'm just moving a little faster because I know I can talk a lot and I want to make sure <laughs> we have plenty of time for conversation. So excuse me if I go really fast, but I'm happy to go back to any of these images later. Um, I also talk about penal matter and that's like, um, it's one, it's the material constraints of making art in prison, especially visual art. And everyone I interviewed who had been in prison just talked about like their absolute preoccupation with how to get access to materials and um, the way that uh, in prison people will innovate, like innovate in terms of like discarded items or like literally the production of color, which for me was just absolutely like just blow, blew my mind the way that in prison people will, um, you know, create color, create a different kind of palette, uh, 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 like as a way of literally resisting um, the way that carcerality structures color and vision and and one of one of the works that is in um, the exhibition in the book is this, is this work by Gilberto Rivera called An Institutional Nightmare. And this is all about color. One, it's his prison uniform, this like dull brown. But it was also about him resisting and refusing the label of gang member. But he was identified as a gang member and was like tortured and surveilled because of that. And all of his work was, you know, like just heavily scrutinized for quote gang colors or gang, you know so this was his kind of rejection of like um that type of surveillance and so this is one example of penal matter another is kenneth reams and kenneth reams is currently in on in prison on, in arkansas and he's hosting a series called, for, called um in the box from death row and i'm going to be in conversation with him on thursday um, and this is the work that he made on death row and it's about and it's called capitalization and it's about um, uh, clearly it's about um, the ways that uh, industries and systems benefit from punishment, but it's also about the, the slow death um, of, the, of people who are on death row in terms of what they have access to and also the um, hyper punishment of the families who are indebted buying these exploitative pro um, products um, for their imprisoned loved ones. Um, and then James Hoff is another example of penal matter where he's talking about racial capitalism and the warehousing of especially black bodies with this work, I am the economy. And then another concept that comes up for me, so it's penal space, penal time, and then penal, uh, penal I'm sorry, penal space, penal matter, and then penal time. And uh, Jared Owen's triptych here, Elapsium, is, you know, a really powerful example of how a lot of imprisoned people conceptualize penal time as you know, as, um, you know, experiencing like every second of their time in prison as a measurement of punishment, but, I'll, but also theorizing and in, in, um, that as um, connect, you know, very much a connection to this long durée of, of Black subjugation and captivity. And so Jared has overlaid the blueprint of Ferriton prison where he was incarcerated um, on top of the Brooks uh, slave ship, which is an icon um, of the abolitionist movement, an 18th century icon that art historian Cheryl Finley beautifully writes about. Um, and um, the color here is also really important. Nick brought up um, kind of carcel colors and um, the oranges of this were for forbidding for both a color for um, a, a, for a, a, a warning for imprisoned people at Ferriton, it's a color that imprisoned people could not cross without being punished. And so for him, this color is really important in turn, and it signifies a lot of his artwork. And he said, it's still a stress color. It's a trigger for him, um, even um, years after being released. Um, another example of penal time is Mary Enoch Elizabeth Baxter, Baxter's video, I, Ain't I a Woman, which is about her duration of, of suffering, of being, um, um, shackle while in labor for 43 hours while she was in prison and connecting it through the title and through the visuals to um, the long history of uh, um, the state controlling black women's reproduction and the immobilization of black women's bodies and i'd be happy to talk more about this work i'm going to move forward really quickly and just show you some installation shots from ps1 Ojuri Lutalo, who was in solitary confinement for 22 years and did in these incredible 
political collages documenting his time in solitary confinement. He and a lot of the other artists who are in the show noted how the courtyard of prison uh, of PS1 looks like a prison yard and so activated that space um, by uh, putting some of his works um, on the outside um, in the courtyard space. Um, when you enter, you, have, you see this, um, Carcel Blue is really important and it's a concept that comes up a lot in the book and the show. And it's, uh, I love what Nick is doing with whiteness and blueness and because um, it, it just speaks so much to like the way that blue um, is this color, this highly symbolic color um, in policing prisons and in various form, systems of punishment. And it's um, what Sable Lee Smith is um, evoking here in this really great landscape, a uh, neon um, work that she did. And she comments a lot on carceral geographies. Um, and she's also a poet. Uh, um, blue in a decade where it finally means sky. Um, and then you enter into this, the main rooms of the gallery. I wanna show you um, really quickly, Mark Lafney's Pyrrhic Defeat. Mark Lafney is currently in prison in um, Pennsylvania and has been doing this series called Pyrrhic Defeat. He's up to 700 portraits of other imprisoned people. And these are all 20 minute sketches. So he asked people to sit for him for 20 minutes. And even during COVID, he's continued this work. So here's the most recent series of imprisoned people in masks. Um, they're all in lockdown 23 hours a day as a way of quote, protective me measure to stop the spread of COVID. And then you enter this room uh, where that's very much about kind of location specific work. You have Ash, um, Ash, Ashley Hunt, who's um, a professor at Cal Arts um, doing this really incredible video called Ashes Ashes, where he's thinking, it's an abolitionist project where he's thinking about the future of Rikers when he says cages are ruins. Um, in conversation with um, Elapsium, the work that I showed you, as well as other work by um, Gilberto Rivera. Um, Gilberto and Jared were in, in prison with Jesse Crimes, and they created this multiracial art collective while in prison. And this is Jesse's Apocalypse team, which is like 39 prison bed sheets uh, that he's uh, done these image uh, transfers onto as another example of the use of penal matter. Um, uh, again, kind of use of penal matter is Sable Lee Smith, this bl uh, the blue and gray uh, six pronged sculpture that looks like um, the stools from visiting rooms in conversation with Daniel McCarthy Clifford, who is in federal prison doing this, um, this anti monument. Again, Nick, this speaks to your work. Uh, for um, uh, Daniel calls this an anti monument, and it's an anti monument to militarism and the relationship between militarism and the prison industrial complex. It weighs a half a ton and it consists of hundreds and hundreds of mill trays from various institutions, from asylum, schools, and prisons. Um, and then the work of Keith uh, Calhoun and Chandra McCormick, um, who've been documenting Angola for four decades and really thinking about that long history of violence, of anti-Black violence on this site that for, for hundreds of years have been about the uh, forced labor and captivity of Black people. Um, and then Rowan Renee's uh, work, No Spirit for Me, which is a work uh, that really engages with the ideas of healing and harm and abolition through the criminal indexes of their father who was um, incarcerated for sex crimes um, and, you know, this is just a really um, incredible work that was labor intensive because Rowan actually did all these tra transfers onto textiles, hundreds of transfers, um, and sees this as part of their healing process um, doing this work. Um, and then these various conversations that take place between artists who've been in prison together and created art communities in prison, like Russell Craig, who's large uh, scale uh, portraits are on the wall in conversation with James Huff. James Huff was his mentor in prison and James Huff did hundreds and hundreds of small scale works during his time in prison. Um, and then um, the finer room is a combination of works by um, Women on the Rise, which is an art collective out of Miami working with young girls um, and women um, in uh, South Florida who've been, uh, who are system impacted in conversation with Sarah Bennett, who's a photographer, used to be a criminal defense attorney, then 
became a photographer documenting women who've been sentenced to life in prison. Um, and, um, and also the work of um, American artists whose, uh, whose sculptures, I'm Blue, Two and Three, is, speaks so much to what you were talking about, Nick, because um, uh, I'm Blue, Two and Three is thinking about uh, the, cat, the creation of the police as a identity category and this kind of this uh, uh, right wing uh, counter movement of Blue Lives Matter, but also the kind of indoctrination that's both about like a kind of militarism of um, the police, but also a pedagogy. So their American artist has combined like these school chairs with, um, with um, uh, what do you call it? shields. Um, and then the f I just, in honor of Ronnie, I wanted to um, end with this wall of his uh, portraits of other imprisoned people um, in San Quentin with him and um, the, the self-portrait that I opened with. Thank you. Wow. Um, thank you, Nicole and uh, Nick. This, this is such a rich, um, set of presentations, where to begin. Uh, one place perhaps we could sort of begin might be to have you both think a little bit with us about um, the social relationships that are reconfigured in the spaces of what Nick called whiteness and of certainly the white space, but also in the space of what you're talking about, Nicole, the car carceral logic. I recall when I when one of the early versions of your project, that photograph, that you began with, with your aunt and uh, his son and you, and you um, struck me as really, really rich in the way it exceeded the relations, the social relations that incarceration tries to structure, right? That, that it was almost impossible through the photograph to contain it. And so, you know, the, the work that you've shown us and the spaces and the histories that Nick has uh, drawn for us have implicit in them really compelling ways of thinking about freedom and abolition through collaborations and relationships. So I wonder if you could sort of talk a little bit about what you both have learned in your work about the, the potentiality of these kind of relationships that go much farther than simply a kind of mediated discursive construction of recognition and do you know what I mean? Like that Western epistemology about being seen. This is in a different register in a different plane. So I wonder if you both could, could maybe think with us a little bit about that. Nick, do you wanna go first? Cause I just talked for a long time. Okay. I, I could listen to you talk all day actually. And I just would, I do wanna begin by paying homage and credit to Nicole's astonishing decade long project that has, I think, literally opened the eyes of so many of us uh, to this extraordinary body of work, but also to this criticality that Herman is evoking, to this relationality that he's evoking, and to make this change, I think, our, our practice in, in very fundamental ways. Uh, and you were kind enough to call out the obvious homologies between my work and yours, which is to say I've learned from you. Um, but I want to just call out two things in going around your exhibition that would not be obvious, I think, to anyone but me. But you mentioned Ronnie Goodman, and I was familiar with the Occupy print from Occupy Wall Street and the mm -hmm. group Occuprint. And so it was a kind of shock of recognition to see it on the wall and to learn something about its maker that I hadn't known before. And then to realize that then I was already affiliated mm -hmm. with this community. In a, in a relation of you know, closeness and belonging. And then on the facing wall, uh, there's a photo of Judy Clark. And um, not to go into too much detail about this, but I'm friends with a close friend of Judy Clark. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I realized that, you know, whereas I might place my, I might be placed by the police officer who passes as I step foot on the street outside PS1 as, white and therefore not implicated in the structures of mass incarceration. That's not the case, that I am inherently connected. And that all of then more broadly, more theoretically, which is what I was trying to say earlier on, that there is no thinking of what we've wanted to call visual culture without thinking this long history 
of coloniality, racial capital, of abolition and incarceration, because the plantation is simply the prefiguration of mass incarceration, as Catherine McKittrick has said it. So it's simply to, to I really just want to acknowledge the enormous debt that I personally, but I think all of us, uh, working in this kind of area, owe to you. And we, we're so grateful for this exhibit. And if anybody who's watching is within COVID safe distance of PS1, don't wait. Get over there tomorrow morning. I took a cycle ride, a ferry, and a long walk to get there. And it was entirely, entirely worth it. Do it tomorrow before, before the city shuts down. Um, it's, a, it's such an amazing experience. Nick, that's incredibly kind of you. And, but I, wanted, I really want to say that like um, this project for me is just like a collective project that I couldn't do if it wasn't for the work of like Angela Davis, if it wasn't for the work of Ruthie Gilmore, of your work, right? It's being in conversation and then like all the artists who are... So, for, so I want to, Herman, your question just made me think about so many things. And I think part of it for me, like is this is a project that like is just about being a student and like being listening and learning from other people and and it was this really aha moment that it 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 sounds embarrassing for me to say this as a professor because it was I'm sure it would sound so pedantic and so basic to everyone else and so many of our brilliant scholars have been telling us this forever but it was through like talking to many of the artists in this project and like seeing how they were forming relationships and like these relationships were challenging in every kind of way, the structures of carcerality and like the division, the like racial apartheid of prisons, the like gender and sexual subjugation in prisons. I mean, they were just challenged doing really radical rethinking of what it means to be together, especially when you are forced to be together, right? And that force being that in, in that very way of um, punitive captivity, it's to breed animosity among the people who are held and stigmatized, right? But then to kind of transform that into these practices of, of love and care and creation, just like we're, it was so mind blowing to me. And it made me, this is the like really basic thought for me, but that was so fundamental. It's like, aha, like, this is what every teacher has been telling me that like the existence of black people on this continent has been one of white people of the state of repression separating us from everyone we love like that is the history right that is literally the, and so like the prison is you know that in that way the prison is so familiar as a site of struggle to stay connected to your loved ones, you know, it, it's like, this is what we have been doing for centuries. It's like resisting uh, every way that, and I don't like using white supremacy, white, and I don't like using white nativism either, white racist structures separate black people from everyone, everything we love, everyone we love. I mean, that is the history of our presence on this, on this continent. And so I was just watching what my aunts do, what my cousins do, what people in prison do. Like Alan would send these elaborate projects home that he had made in prison and that often he would be paying money to like get art made for us. And, just, and it was like, this is all of the labor that we put in into just stay, just being able to show up and love our, lo our loved ones. So that, what you said about exceeding that the, that isolation and that separation that's what kept just coming up to me and it was like and it was like the thing that kept that propelled me to do this work I was like this is incredible what people do to love each other under these systems of this like brutal system of uh be, that goes beyond captivity but it's just a rendering of people as um Irrelevant is not even the word I'm looking for either, but it's a way, I mean, this is where I guess I, I kept being interested in discernment of the idea of like thinking through one's captivity and thinking through the kind of elements of the prison system as a way of 
taking them apart to make art. And that for me was just unbelievably fascinating and just like so, um, it inspired me in terms of thinking about the way the radical collectivities that take, that I can participate in. Um, you know, the, 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 the notion of discernment, I think um, both of you, and we talked about this a little bit in another context though, the, the powerful way that um, feelings, that affect, that resonance also works both in social movement contexts in which uh, Nick has been thinking about with Black Lives Matter and Occupy and the sort of carceral logics that you've been describing so richly for us, right? But there's this other register in which the, 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 the visual work also does something else. It works on another level. It's not just optical. It's not just at the level of yeah, seeing right? so right. these other spaces. I think that's absolutely right. That's why like you all have kept bringing up practices. So these are like, I mean, I didn't, I mean, one of the things like, I didn't know I was going to do an exhibition, but I resisted the exhibition feeling like just something, something objects on the wall. Like I really, that, so I was very interested in the practices of, of actually creating, especially under these conditions, right? And it's the, to me, it's the practice that's about a type of discernment. And like one example that I've, I've, I brought up recently was like this artist in the book, Moliere de Manche, who, who's uh, in solitary confinement and experiencing all kinds of brutality. And he has a visit from his mother and he's sitting at uh, this slab, this like white concrete slab. And he realizes that same gathering space where he's meet, meeting his mother is as the same slab that they use to bury imprisoned people, right? And so he's making the, like this proximity, like living in this proximity to death all the time and using that to make art as an impetus for art making. So there's all kinds of things that I think are taking place through the visual. Um, but I do, you know, I, I do, I, I am very interested in like having this in conversation with what Nick was saying about like, uh, visuality and abolition, like that kind of tension there, because I for I, I got I get the pushback all the same all the time around like my use of carceral aesthetics. They're like, isn't that isn't there? What's the tension there? Isn't that the opposite, right? And that's for me part of like what what it means to put those uh, put 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 those two terms together is to think about what it means to produce and to create and to dream and to discern from the site of captivity, from punitive captivity specifically, from immobilization, lack of access. Um, you know, there's an entire chapter right about solitary confinement where the, uh, the practice of art making is really partly about um, the resistance of becoming unhinged to use like Lisa Gunther's description of what happens, the kind of breakdown that takes place in solitary confinement. Uh, way in, Nick. Yeah, that's such a rich set of comments, and that. But it, let me think about it, trying to intersect it with it in this one way, which is, I think, one of the moments that distinguishes our current conversation. Obviously, because the exhibition has had to close in California, is is that we are in this peculiar pandemic pause, and mm -hmm. obviously we know that incarcerated people have been heavily implicated in the epidemic and so striking when you walk in the exhibition that the first thing you see are portraits of incarcerated people wearing masks but mm. one of the th ways in which I think that those of us in New York for example felt this resonance that you've been talking about is when we became aware of the way in which incarcerated people were burying the dead on Hart mm. Island which is in in between the Bronx and Long Island the Papers Island we were, is what they right, call it. Yeah, and we were seeing this image from the sky, um, it's a, a drone image that was taken by a journalist, and suddenly realizing that all of these practices, which is, which white supremacy or white racism, however you wish to describe it, uh, wish to keep rigorously segregated, are not. And uh, the accumulation of the dead in the streets of the city of New York made it visible that, you know, I called it a necropolis. I mean, it's a city of the Literally. Dead. Mm -hmm. And there is a direct intersection and, and a layering. Uh, again, just to give a brief example, the new museum downtown, one of our favorite museums, no doubt, and for many reasons, 
is built over a section of the second Negro burial ground mm -hmm. that had to that opened when the first one was closed because they wanted to build over it. And it was a tiny patch of land. And they allowed them to excavate that site for a weekend, uh, in which time a number of human remains were discovered and uh, a headstone. And no doubt a lot more could have been found, but they went ahead and they completed the work and they, the new museum now rests above that burial ground. And that's when I think of haunting, I think of how could you do that? What, what, what does it mean to not think that through in the way that you have so rigorously and carefully and rigorously thought through these connections that you're talking about, which, as you say, a term like castle aesthetics, I think the new museum is in the space there of castle aesthetics, mm -hmm. whether it knows it or not, and it's in, in the tension that it embodies, or a museum like the American Museum of Natural History, which is littered with human remains, many of which were taken from Africa during the genocide in Namibia of the early 20th century, and they will not relinquish these things. Well, so all museums are. I mean, all museums are uh, like uh, the whole, and this is, I write about this in chapter one, is like the, mm -hmm. the, the creation of the museum is to be, the museum is meant to be in conversation with the prison. Mm -hmm. yes. They're like, <laughs> they're these institutions you merge around the same time, and they're often built literally in proximity to each other as a way of educating and disciplining the public. Mm -hmm. They're meant to be, you know, and they are systems of value, devaluation. They're, they're both, they both are aesthetic projects, right? right. And they're both about collecting, like literally about collecting, mm -hmm. right? They mm -hmm. are, they are invest, they're, they're, they're not the opposites. They are twins of like, you know, of, 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 a, of the kind of building of, um, of, West, of modern Western societies. Mm. Indeed. And I mean, the museum is formed, I would say explicitly at the precise moment where the Haitian revolution has made it clear mm -hmm. that visualizing is not a project that will be unopposed, that, and it, that constituent power and in a different form exists. And, and that people have... have to be trained, sorry to interrupt, but right. people have to right. be trained to see, right? So the mm -hmm. museum mm -hmm. is training people to see. Mm -hmm. And they're also being trained to see the prison as, a, as this place you don't want to enter, right? So that's why there's like the Gothic structure of, a, of like Eastern State Penitentiary is so important because it, 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 it is meant to discipline and to create fear and to then <laughs> for people to internalize that fear, right? Mm -hmm. So these are aesthetic projects. That's entirely accurate. And I think about the imperial Gothic that emerges in 19th century Britain as the architecture of colleges and art schools, but of course also prisons and workhouses. And not just in Britain, but around the British Empire, around the world. Uh, and it finds its resonance across North America too. And about laboring bodies, you just said the workhouse, right? It's about also Working, because yeah. prison, the, the mandate of prison was very much about the laboring bodies, also what to do with imprisoned people and their bodies. And the production of value. And, yeah, exactly. And, and in this shutdown, well, what are the trustees of the British Museum did uh, a Zoom in which they said, well, young children want to go to museums to see dead bodies, meaning mummies, meaning so-called which are of course embalmed human beings. And this, this, it gave me such pause to think really that yeah. the function of the museum is to teach children to experience death as pleasure, as entertainment, as something to be looked at and, and, and treated as a educational entertainment experience rather than as tragedy, rather than as uh, mm -hmm or as a transition to a different mode of being, uh, to a different form of life. As if, you know, imagine North Africans went to dig up Winston Churchill and put him on display <laughs> in Algiers or Morocco or somewhere like that. Um, and why not at this point? But I, I find, you know, the, the strength of resonance in your show and in your work to be, it's, most powerful and compelling point in some ways in that no one can say, mm -hmm. well, this is just about a, a practice of prisons and, and the way that people deal with being in prison. You can't say that. 
it contains the whole project of the aesthetic as such. And that, you know, when we, you talk about cultural aesthetics, the aesthetic begins again at the same moment, right? Mm -hmm. And that late 18th, early 19th century moment that the prison begins and then the museum begins. You can't separate them, mm -hmm. that they are the creation of the same moment. So questions are beginning to come in. And before we go to one, I, I just want to raise this, this provocation with both of you. Um, so we've been talking about museums and artwork and performances of one sort or another. And of course, my interests uh, are in kind of electronic culture, television, streaming, um, social platforms. And I'm recalling, um, I, I was saying in my remarks too about the normalization of policing. Right. And trying to think about the powerful ways in which both of you have talked about um, carceral logics and policing and warehousing. I was trying to think about how um, television flattens it all out. It just makes heroic narratives about protection and security of property. And I was thinking about an episode of Atlanta, a very short little episode where one of the characters has to be in a police station. And the violence in that moment is so compelling. Mm -hmm. Now for me, what's compelling about it is the way in which the filmmaker, the showrunner is able to capture just with the blink of an eye, both the violence, the degradation, the paralysis, the authority, all of the things that Nicole has been writing about, right? In, in tacking between carceral logics and practices of freedom. And I guess my question or comment is how difficult it is or how lazy filmmakers have been or writers have been about actually doing what you've done in the book, uh, Nicole, that is to say revealing the details and the procedures and the practices and the violations on camera in front of us, because this is another modality of, you know, of normalization and naturalization for these relations of-, of well, Angela, Angela Davis has that great quote that like prisons are just a part of like, they're so part of our environment that it's that they're just like commonsensical now, right? Mm -hmm. so, so you can show a one second clip of a prison and the narrative has been filled in, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, you were talking about a kind of late, but you, we can use lazy or whatever, but I think it's also, it's, it's been, it's so loaded with meaning, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That all you, all you need is one second and you can fill in the blanks, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's really what, how prisons are so, you know, it's not just about the built environment and it's not just about the threat of, <laughs> you know, being, Cap, uh, you know, being captured. It's about their, we, the psychic code they take on mm -hmm. us. Yeah, yeah. Literally the psychic code yes. that prisons take on right. our, our, uh, our, uh, our imaginative capacity. And that's why I think this idea of visualizing abolition is so important because we are, we, we are tethered, our, our image world is so tethered to captivity. And it's, in, it's here that it's so tethered to captivity. Mm -hmm. Great. Let, me, let me turn to a question. Is, uh, in your book, Nicole, you talk a bit about the influence of the, the, the coming together of art worlds, right? Both the art worlds of, um, of creativity among the incarcerated and the art worlds kind of outside of prisons and the ways in which they are mutually kind of seeing each other now, I suppose. And here's a question that says, um, I would like to ask about the possible paradoxes of care in terms of stewardship of these artworks. Dr. Fleetwood's leadership with, his ex with this exhibit is truly exemplary. However, I wonder or worry about the expectation regarding institutional collecting of carceral artwork. In particular, I'm thinking about the Smithsonian collecting works by detained children along the U.S.-Mexico border. I guess that one's for you. Nicole. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm, I'm, the, que I, the question is spot on. And, you know, it's, 
I mean, I, there's a there's a million things I could write a book about just collecting the or this this issue of collecting around um, art made and in, in states of unfreedom. And one of the things that I want to say is that um, you know a, a lot of the art that is that I'm even that I write about the circulation of it is so precarious and so um, sometimes so not transparent. So for example, a lot of imprisoned people make work, they're being, they're commissioned by other imprisoned people to make work, which for me was also fascinating to think about the major collectors of art in prison are actually other imprisoned people. But there's also these, you know, kind of strange relations that are taking place where imprisoned people are making art for prison staff, for prison guards, mm -hmm. and um, and then there's these collaborations that take place between nonprofit organizations, museums, and imprisoned people. And one of the things that I write, that I wrote, and I, and I still think this to this day, but I, I, it strikes me and makes me uncomfortable every time I say it, is that imprisoned people can't legally consent. Like they're, coll quote, collaborating with these artists. With, like your, stat your legal status is you're unfree. How can you consent to any of these, any of these kind of engagements or um, you know, ways of quote participating in um, these relational works? Um, and I also think that there's this, other, uh, this huge other area of then how that work circulates. It cir circulates through these outsider art markets, through mm -hmm. folk art markets. Um, a lot of times the names of the persons removed or it's a code name or so there's all kinds of structures of inequality that get reproduced when you start talking about art markets and people and artists who are unfree or artists who are like working outside of established art institutions and that the, those that in, inequality gets heightened um, when you're talking about people who are like locked up for life or people who like uh, Billy Sell, who's someone in my book, and he, he died during a hunger strike, mm -hmm. and he has he, there's art that that was left behind, right? So there, you know that like there's a way that all of that inequality is heightened when you start talking about art markets. And I, I don't, I mean, this might sound like a cop out, but I don't deal with art markets or like I'm not, I'm not in the I, people write me and ask, can I buy? I'm like, I'm not in the business of buying and selling art. Um, and, and, and there's for a lot of reasons, because, but also I think if you want to look at the face of capitalism, look at art markets, right? Like I mean, look at the way that arts, art gets circulated by and so not to say that this is removed from it, but I'm just saying it's, that's a whole can of worms that I think is another book. Yeah. Yeah. Um, here's, a, here's one for you, Nick. It says, Dr. Uh, Merzef uh, spoke about the seeming monopolization of the geographic by the conquest settler colonialism via top-down visual strategies. Could you speak more about abolitionist geographies or what the stakes are in thinking of abolitionists as geographers? What kind of alternative spatial visual ways of knowing are employed in an anti-logic of racial capitalism? Yeah. That's a great question. Um, Castle geography, I think, is a, is a key element. Uh, it certainly comes up very strongly in Nicole's work. I think all of this work increasingly we're pushed to think about space and, uh, in ways that are not necessarily contained to the Euclidean three ge geometric dimensions, but thinking about ways in which space and time interact and intersect and are layered in striking ways. I mean, we, we saw it in the Coles exhibition, this diagram of the books, which is an ar architectural ship underlying the present mm -hmm. conditions of incarceration and the two connecting to each other or the video by Isis the Savior where she's using the words attributed to Sojourner Truth, ain't I a woman? Mm -hmm. And it's not clear whether Sojourner Truth herself actually said it. And, where truth had to prove in certain public arenas to skeptical slave owners that she was, as they saw it, a woman and was without hesitation willing to reveal herself and yet had to do that. And, and I think about how our imaginary um, 
uh, abolitionist imaginary so often centers around pain and, and, and around punishment and how we might how we might disaggregate those things. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways that that has been a, has we've seen that tonight uh, has been in thinking about different ways to understand the practice of abolition as the creation of care, as the creation of community, as the creation of relation and of a learning from, mm -hmm. from rather than us going to such spaces to, to teach, do we go to those spaces to learn? Uh, and that's then, I think that would change our research practices. It might change our community of learning practices. Certainly, I mean, I can think in parallel example to Nicole's of going to Palestinian refugee camp. And mm. the minute I entered that space, on the one hand, encountering a remarkable community of care, and on the other hand, realizing that all my rather fancy academic ideas that I brought with me were worthless in the context of, of the fundamental relation of unfreedom that was being experienced there. And I had to begin to learn again. Mm -hmm. And I think we, we can all benefit from that. Mm -hmm. Here's a question um, for me, actually. Part of media like film and text for all of us, actually is that they are not just visual forms. Can you speak to how the activation of other senses through media can lead to abolition or aid us in working towards it? Um, and um, I'll take a, a crack at this because one of the issues that I've been concerned about is the capacity of something like news and the crime beat as it were to desensitize us to um, spaces of harm and spaces of insecurity and spaces of unfreedom. And so much of the kind of activism around media studies and visibility has been um, organized around what I called in another piece of uh, the facts of the matter, accuracy. Do we, do we get the kinds of images on television and in cinema that we find uplifting and important and I've been shifting from that to what I call a, a kind of ethics of care. Can television, can popular media gather us around concerns like unsafety, like insecurity? Can we begin, and, and so I suppose this speaks to the spaces of co-presence that you talk about, Nick, in the spaces of appearance, right? Can we, in a way, begin to cultivate the sensuality, not in the sexual sense, but in the sense of being alert to the ways that pain is actually all around us. But the capacities of media broadcast to sort of flatten it, basically, you know, heightens up the capacity to be alarmed, to be shocked. And so I've been thinking a lot about Marlon Riggs's work in Tongues Untied as a precursor to Terence Nash, Nance's work in Random Acts of Flyness, because I want to suggest that Random Acts of Flyness and Riggs together produce a model of care in which visual culture actually activates these other registers that might be put in the service of the kinds of uh, aspirations that both of you are writing about in terms of the space to contest, but also to assert and to, and to um, be present, co-present in very other sort of registers. So I, I love this. And we talked about it a little when we were just kind of in an earlier conversation about this kind of like one of the things about prisons or just class reality more broadly is like the kind of restructuring, like a multi-sensory restructuring. Mm -hmm. Like, so it's mm -hmm. not just like that prisons are about kind of obfuscating mm -hmm. a vision, but it's also about like often like sensory overload or sensory deprivation. It's about like people leaving prisons and still smelling a kind of, mm -hmm. kind of sanitized smell that's actually like patented in, the, in, in, the, in California. It's a kind of smell that like every single prison in California smells like it's, a, it's patented, right? So right. it's a radical restructuring of like, and it's a touch, right? Like mm -hmm. people in solitary confinement who, are mm -hmm. releases really, that they can't, they actually can't be physically touched because it hurts, right? Mm -hmm. So I do think that we, you know, um, as much as this is about 
uh, kind of visualizing, you know, that visualizing is also about other ways of being in the body, right? That it's both like we can have a part of like a sensory experience, but it's also like an, uh, an opening or a pathway mm -hmm. to other ways, other types of embodiment, other ways of being. And Herman, you were talking about resonance before, mm -hmm. and I love the idea of resonance or reverberation, right? Like, so mm -hmm. it is kind of like thinking about auditory, but it's also, I think, another way of like uh, feeling being inside uh, of our, like, the shell of our body when mm -hmm. we're so, where we don't get lo lost lost in just kind of an, one way of engaging the world right 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 and i was uh, just thinking like how the museum is like focusing on this right yeah, but then yeah. there's but there's when you're in the museum you're also hearing and you're feeling you know there's other ways of that i think we have to be educated of mm -hmm. um Nick, go ahead. We're coming sure. to the end, so uh, I, I, yeah. I'll be extremely brief. Uh, okay. Social movements spread by resonance. I mean, we saw that. You occupy movements spring up overnight. Black Lives Matter movements spring up. Nobody tells people to do that. They just do. Mm -hmm. It's something you feel. You feel like it. it, it an embodied action to go somewhere. It mm -hmm. might be co-present with the internet, as you were saying, Herman. That you might follow a hashtag. You might follow a link. But you go someplace. And mm -hmm. one of the things we've seen too is the way that the police, and Nicole spoke to this, use invisible forms as modalities of social control. So they've been flying helicopters very low over New York City since the election as a mode of disrupting everybody's life because the sound is loud. It's really hard to, to, to speak even, let alone mm -hmm. uh, to communicate. That's invisible. They'll tie, they'll arrest people with plastic ties, pull them really tight, and that will cause nerve damage yeah. in people's yeah. hands yeah. very quickly, but it leaves no marks when they take yeah. them off. There's nothing that you can't sue. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's no claim to be made. And yeah. so it's always a multiple, a multi-level contestation, I yeah. feel. Yeah. Um, and we learn from we learn from social movements, we learn from how the, how these practices are being embodied every day. Yes. in producing new forms of resistance. And uh, we are not done with this. This is that we, at that same time, we are in a moment where here we are having a conversation yeah. in front of a large group of people about abolition. And that, yeah. that is something that we should not, not let this occasion pass without noting that it has happened. Yeah. It's important that it happens. Right. It's, the, and the, the kind of people that have been, whose work has been saluted tonight are not the people we would have been talking about 10, mm -hmm. 15, 20 years ago, some of us. And others, of course, people yeah. would, but that this is now mainstream, I think it's extremely important. Mm -hmm. And it begins to contest, Herman, I, I hope, that white imaginary, I did this practice during yeah. the lockdown, yeah. uh, where I would take the TV listings and I would blew out everything that was to do with cops and crime. Yeah. And you lose, if, if, once you exclude news yeah. and sports, it's yeah. almost everything. It's empty. It's almost well, listen, empty. On that note, we're going we're gonna to close. Um, I, I so appreciate and thank both of you, Nicole and Nick, for a generous and provocative and thoughtful and inspiring exchange. Thank you both for such amazing work and uh, for being co-collaborators uh, on this conversation. Thanks to uh, Gina and to Rachel and the crew. And I'm gonna hand it back over. We just wanna remind the audience that we have a musical treat. And so please <laughs> hang on. And uh, it's, it's, very, uh, it's very compelling. So thank you all. And uh, we're gonna sign off for now. It's back to Gina and to Rachel. Oh, thank you all so much. What an amazing conversation. We could, we could keep going with this for quite a long time. Uh, we look forward to more. So uh, we're going to end tonight, as we have been, by premiering a new video brought to us by our music curator, Terry Lynn Carrington. This one is called Can You Imagine? Can You Imagine is a collaborative work between Mumu Fresh and Queen Cora that shares an in-depth journey of a young boy who fell victim to the highest expression of insecurity through white supremacy. This young man later becomes the father of Mumu Fresh. Can you imagine a piece that shares the hope of new perspective goes on to encapsulate the vision of life through poetry, 
without the need for bondage and incarceration because love and imagination serve as the primary expression of human engagement. Can you imagine? Lyrics by Mamuna Youssef, AKA Muma Fresh, poetry and music production, Queen Cora Coleman, mastered by Carlos Garza. Mumu Fresh is filmed by Nisha Crooms. Queen Cora is filmed by Sadari Scott. And more information about these amazing artists will be on our website, barringfreedom.org in the music for abolition section. Thank you so much for attending tonight and please enjoy. The question is, can we see freedom? Is it bondage never existed? Let me fresh. He could even afford kids. Top of his class, his friends called on the teacher's case. A credit to his race, always smiles on his face. On the ground side of town, he kept his crown in place. So one day he crossed the train tracks to a new school, and they ain't never seen that. But the state promised new opportunities to be stared in the face and criticized with impunity. Needless to say, his grades began to plummet. He fought every day or ran away from it. Nigga this, nigga that, was more than he could stomach. He built a crew that could take on any crumble. It was long no Snooky, Big Black and Chooky, Roscoe, Bo Chief, and Lil Pookie. They met up at the middle school playground for the white gangs and they lead a ton of boost to come around. They fought one on one and two on two till the cops pulled up and beat my dad black and blue. They charged him with assault and kicked him out of the school. See, the son of the officer was a ton of boots. My dad was 12 years old with a criminal record. And where could he go where they wouldn't check it? They saw him as a threat set up a child neglected and unprotected by a system innately infected. Sometimes I wish I could have raised my dad, given him opportunities that my grandma never had. I would have flown him around the globe with my band and placed the whole world in the palm of his hands. Imagine. Can you imagine what we could be? Can you imagine the power of me? If we can see Write the wrongs, write the wrongs, write the wrongs. 